That's what you do, Lord. If you confess this morning to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, raise a hand. The Spirit of God resides in you and you burn with his presence. That's who he's made us to be. Presence carriers, a home for God himself. And when those flames come together, wow, what a powerful picture. Not just of a concept, but of a reality. It's no wonder that when the early church had the spirit land on them, the thousands were added to their number. Thousands. Because the spirit burned upon them. He no longer lived, no, no longer lived in a temple made of stone. He lived in his people. And that's what he's doing with us right now. Thank you, Lord. Maybe we can take our seats and keep hold of that thought at the same time. Thanks to the band. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Ben. Good to see you. Great to spend that time worshipping. It means that the best thing about that is it means you get the short version from me. <laughs> Unless you don't. Um, but actually, it's amazing how the Lord leads us, isn't it? Because that picture there is something I actually wanted to speak about anyway. I didn't know that we were going to land on that song. You know, I had some great stories, but I'm going to skip them so that you do get the short version. Um, In preparing for today, I was conscious that the last time we were together as a whole like this, I spoke about unity, and we talked about the power of us coming together, the oneness that we have as one church in many places, and there's something powerful about us coming together, but we're still uniformed, and we're still unified when we're scattered as well, of course. And we talked about unity, not uniformity, and just the blessing that follows and flows from unity and that kind of thing. And as I've been thinking about today, I just really haven't been able to go anywhere else. I've just felt the Lord saying to me, unity, 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 unity. Unity. So I'm kind of just going to go into the same space in a different way because I think it's an incredibly important and powerful thing. And it's not because I think we lack unity. It's because I think God is giving us some unity and he wants us to be so aware of the power and importance of it that we relentlessly pursue it together. That we love him and we love one another and we come together and we do not let our enemy come between us. You know, we are seeing God move. The stories from the youth residential, from the youth from Derby and Nottingham, which can hopefully spread much further into the future, are remarkable. As we come together, God touching our young people in incredible ways. I love seeing them, I don't know whether anyone noticed, I love seeing them taking communion over here just earlier in a circle, our young people praying together. So what does a circle tell us? It tells us something of unity and God moves. And it's when we lose our unity, it's when we use that oneness of spirit, that unity of spirit, that we start to see things dry up a little bit. So if we want to see God move amongst us in our own lives, in our corporate life, wherever we might be, and we want to see a move of God in, the, in our cities and our nation, then Unity is an essential foundation. Unity of the Spirit. That's what God's calling us to. And we're not doing it the easy way because, you know, it, it, it's, it's not easy to be unified across a larger space. It's something that needs work and attention and intentionality. And so I just want to encourage us into that more today. And um, just like we're going to start by looking at these simple verses from Ephesians what, four, one to six. It says this. This is Paul 
writing from prison to the Ephesians. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, both of you. They're incredible words, aren't they? And if you've been around Reach at all and we, you hear the, phrase, you hear, you hear the um, reference to Ephesians 4, you're probably expecting me or someone else to immediately jump to start talking about the Ephesians 4 ministries, apostles, prophets, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, because it's a foundation upon which we build. But actually what I want to do is just live in these verses a little bit today, because if we don't grab hold of what's here, everything else that Paul has to say is a waste of time. This is a foundation that Paul is putting in, into the church, in order for it to have that foundation to be built upon, so that the saints can be equipped for works of service, uh, the church can become mature, people can grow into all they can be, and then the, the whole world around it can be transformed. But without this, there's nothing. There's nothing. Paul says, I urge you then to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What's that calling? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not about your calling to be a teacher, good as that is, or your calling to be a firefighter, or someone who operates in the business world, or maybe even a pastor in a church, or whatever it might be. This is about the calling you've received, and I've received, to be a son or a daughter of the living God, to be his children, and to come into his presence, and to represent him on the earth. That's our calling. Paul says, first thing we need to do is live a life worthy of that calling. What does that look like? Can anyone tell me? Shout something out. Righteousness. Righteousness. Love. Love. Patience. (laughs) Kindness. The fruits of the Spirit. All kinds of good. Amen. Living these things out. Jesus says that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. But before that, we should love love God with everything we've got. Paraphrase. Love God with everything we've got and love your neighbor as yourself. Do that and all the things that just got shouted out will follow. You'll live a life worthy of your calling. Pretty good. And actually, Paul then helps us understand this a bit more in the next few verses. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. How's that going? Who finds it a breeze coming to a big gathering like this on a Sunday? I bet, there's, I bet we're all completely in agreement about everything we're doing. And nobody had an argument in the car on the way here. Nobody got slightly upset about something that happened or something someone said or something didn't, someone didn't say. It's not happened. Because we are being completely humble and gentle. We're being patient and we're bearing with one another in love, aren't we? All the time. You see, the very nature of the church is it brings different people together who are inevitably different, have different perspectives, different views, different triggers, different family of origin stories. And the only way we can be united is if we do this. It's not about me. What we do... As a church, is not about me. We are, as a church, we, as we come together, if we find that unity, there's something incredibly powerful. But if we squabble, squabble, good word, then unity is lost. And where's the spirit? Paul says this, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I think this is uh, remarkable when we dwell on it. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, there there are many different spirits in which we can operate, operate, aren't there? There there is a spirit of adventure. I went walking with a friend the other day, and um, 
we kind of were out in the middle of nowhere as far as I was concerned. And we were saying, do we turn left? Do we turn right? And, and we said, in the spirit of adventure, let's go this way and see where it takes us. <laughs> I've been with people recently and we've kind of thought, someone's birthday is coming up. Why don't we club together and in the spirit of generosity, let's give to this person. It's good to operate in the spirit of unity, isn't it? Isn't it? That's not a bad thing. But that's not what this says. It doesn't say, in the spirit of unity, because we think unity is a good thing, let's kind of try and get on a bit. No, it doesn't say that. It says, keep every, keep every effort, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. Not the spirit of unity, the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In other words, the unity of the Spirit, the the unity of God Himself is amongst us, and we are to make every effort to keep it. God Himself is the perfect picture of unity. Father, Son, and Spirit as one in complete unity as a community. The Spirit of God is amongst us. And we are called to make every possible effort we can to keep that unity because he's resting on us. Do you like we just prayed and sang? He's resting on us. And if we don't keep the unity of the Spirit of God who's with us, guess what God does? He finds somewhere else to dwell. So what does it look like for us to keep the unity of the Spirit. Well, Paul tells us, through the bond of peace. Through the bond of peace. That's me making an agreement with you that no matter what, I'm going to keep peace with you. And that the fire will rage in me and in you and in us. And we'll take that out with us. Is that what we want? That's what I want to be a part of. That's what I'm excited about. That's what I believe God wants to do with us. Let's just go to um, Pentecost for a moment. Uh, In that moment at Pentecost, um, which was a festival about 50 days after the Passover, um, and in the beginning of the story of Acts, we've got Jesus, and he says to the disciples, particularly the 12, or whether 10, and then there's 11, and then there's another one, make it 12 again. He says, stay in Jerusalem until... The Spirit comes, and then when the Spirit comes, I'm going to send you to the ends of the earth. So they stay in Jerusalem, as Jesus has said. And they've no idea what he's talking about, by the way, but they stay in Jerusalem. And then on the day of Pentecost, they are gathered in this room. And because there's this celebration called Pentecost, where the the Jewish people and those who've converted to Judaism from around the whole known world have come together to this one place. And while they're sat in this home, the Spirit does come. The Spirit, there's like a sound, like a rushing wind. And then the Spirit begins to fall. And then tongues of fire appear and they separate and they land on each of them's head. And there's this fire burning. The Spirit of God has come to dwell within them because no longer is He in the temple, but He's come to make His home in them. He's come to make his home in them. And it's such a powerful, attractive thing that it draws the attention. They're in a home. They're in a house. But it draws the attention of everybody around. And then they start to see what's going on. And these people think that they're drunk. But they're speaking in all manner of other languages. You see, these people have been so scattered for so long, generations, that they all have other different languages. And the the, 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 the disciples who suddenly have the Spirit of God on them are speaking the languages of the people who have come around and they're understanding them as they preach the gospel in a language they don't understand and speak of the kingdom of God. And these people are suddenly themselves caught up into the unity of the Spirit and begin to find God themselves. And boom, the church is born and there's a raging fire. A raging fire. There's a couple of interesting... Oh, forget the notes. There's a couple of interesting things about that, Okay. Number one, if we were, this is going to test me, if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 11, we see one of the low points of humankind before God's plan for redemption kicks in, the Tower of Babel. 
we have all these people coming together who have one language. They've got one language. And they come together and they say, let us build a tower up to the heavens in order that we might have power and be like God. And God sees that this is going on and he hears this and it, this, the scriptures tell us that, that he came down and observed what was going on. And here's a really interesting thing that he says. He says, if we let them do it, they will achieve it. I mean, every time I've read that, it blows me away. How is that possible? If we let them do it, they will achieve it. And so he doesn't let them do it. And he confuses them with all manner of different languages and disperses them all over the world. I'm not, I don't know how that works, by the way. I imagine this guy suddenly popping up in, by a lake speaking Norwegian. And um, another guy suddenly, suddenly he doesn't know where he is. And he's got this funny hat on and a can of Fosters in his hand or something. And he's like, I don't know what. They're like, these guys must have been truly confused. Truly confused. But they've been dispersed all over the world. Because God didn't like what they were doing. Because, it, because there was something of, uh, actually, a, a worship of Satan in that to be like God. So he did away with it. But here's the thing. There's power in unity. doesn't matter if it's good unity or bad unity. There's power in it. And they had the potential in their unity, which was complete, one language, one goal, they had the potential to reach the heavens. That's scary, isn't it? Our God's more powerful than that, and he just dispersed them to Australia. The first 10 pound palms. <laughs> I just made that up, so I don't, that was a bad thing to say. Um, that's what happens when you don't follow the notes. You say bad things, and then you have to repent publicly. Man, we're short of time. Genesis 12, the story of Abraham. This is the beginning of God's plan for redemption, where one man has a dream, and he sees all manner of stars in the sky, and the, God says to him, you, my friend, are going to be like that. You will be a father of a family that will become a nation that will bless the world, and the whole world will be redeemed through your family, says God. It's too much for Abraham to even comprehend because he's not even had one son and he's very old. But God begins this process through Abraham of his descendants becoming the people of God. And they do all right, but over time, they, they don't do very well. And there's a season after season of falling out with one another and a lack of unity and falling out with God and a lack of unity. There's a lack of unity up. There's a lack of unity across. And God has to keep in, keep stepping in and, and bring some correction and punishment because he really can't stand this lack of unity around him. And they end up exiled and dispersed and further and further and further apart to the point where they have all manner of different languages even because they have become a different spread out people group. It was supposed to be the answer to the problems of the world. And so we get to Pentecost. And what does God do? He suddenly breaks the curse of language and makes his power break out. His power breaks out. He wants to disperse the people through language. Now he's bringing them together through it, and his power is breaking out. He's got all these people who are supposed to represent his unity that haven't done, and they're in one place, and among them, his power is breaking out. His power is breaking out. He's redeeming all these things. And new temples of the Spirit in unity are being formed. It's an incredible picture. Incredible picture. Man, I'm going fast here. Okay, so now we're back in Acts, and we're skipping forward to Acts 2, 42 to 47, where, let me just show you it. I'll put it on the screen. You can read it while I'm talking. Um, this is an incredibly well-known passage of Scripture. This is the birth of the early church. And the people are together. They've literally just started. 
Uh, God's breaking out. There's power, miracles, um, healings, all kinds of things are happening. And the people are together. And they have everything in common. If that's not a picture of unity, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. That's what the beginnings of the church looked like. Now remember, these people, this was an intercultural church. These people were coming from all over the known world. They may have had, they may have had Jewish roots, but many of them were converted to Judaism. And now they're here, and some of them are staying. Some of them are taking this message back. Uh, in Jerusalem, they're meeting in the temple, and they're meeting in homes. Um, but there's a unity amongst them that is incredibly beautiful and powerful. And as a result, thousands are being saved. So they are loving being together. They're growing in maturity. They're becoming everything God made them to be. And they are getting to be the people who God always wanted them to be, those who he partners with for the redemption of all mankind. What more could we possibly dream of? And this is what excites me, uh, people, if you can't tell. The fact, the possibility that we have the opportunity, because we are the church, the bride of Christ in our generation, to step into being that. If we, across our different cultures, and ethnicities, and geographical locations can focus and push into the unity of the Spirit, be temples of the Holy Spirit, and allow Him to set us on fire. So, Paul, in Ephesians 4, why is he teaching this where we started? Why is he teaching this? Because between Acts 2 and Ephesians 4, humanity's kicked in. The, you know, the, the um, honeymoon period is over. And the, the church is having some scruffles and some grumbles and there's people upset. And they're turning on one another. Because that's what humans do. And it's why we must protect the unity of the Spirit. And it's why Paul teaches it now, before he goes on to teach how the church might become full of impact. He wants to remind them of this. If we don't have the unity of the Spirit of God, then we open the door to our enemy, whose one desire is to ensure we don't have it. And he will come between us in any and every way possible. He will accuse, he will sow doubt. He will lie. He will tear us apart. And the more we see signs of God, the more the enemy is on alert. He did, if we're ineffective, he'll just leave us alone. But if we're if beginning to be more effective than we've ever been, or as effective as we dream to be, then we better be on our guard that the enemy is going to come, attempt to come between us. And it's my passion that we don't allow it. Because it's not about me and my preferences and my brokenness and me being offended at different things. Sure, the leaders are not going to get it right. It's not all going to be perfect. But if we can journey together somehow with grace, with grace, being completely humble and gentle, patient and bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit of God through the bond of peace, who knows what we might see in our day. Amen? Amen. Look at that, quarter past 12. Managed to get there. Can we stand together? There was a more windy road to get there with some very, very brilliant stories, I can promise you. <laughs> what do we want? What do we want? I think we want the Spirit of God to fall, don't we? I know we've got to go and send people to collect the kids. I'm going to let these guys take responsibility with what we do with that. But I believe that there are fires burning on our heads. And if we really want it, and we really choose to push into the unity of the Spirit, all manner of things might happen. And I don't know what your response is today, but I encourage you to make one before you leave this place. Amen.